What would you say are some of the most frustrating or persistent nutrition myths that you keep se seeing online or in the media, ones that you would you know, like to kind of finally put to bed? Well, one big one for me is milk, that we shouldn't be drinking milk. Like, oh my goodness. <laughs> Especially as a micronutrient researcher, milk is so nutritious, right? If you can have milk, then include milk in the diet because it has more than 10 essential nutrients. A small proportion of the population can't make the lactose as efficiently, so they avoid it altogether rather than potentially looking for lactose-free milk. Another, um, I guess, myth um, that I see a lot, which was only really until recently that I, I thought it was it's a myth, is on 100% juice. So growing up in Brazil, 100% um, juice is very much part of the diet. You can There's a smogus board of different fruits and flavors, right? Like literally ones that probably many people haven't even heard of. So I grew up drinking juice, absolutely love it. It's mentally processed food. It's a whole food. It's got vitamins and minerals. And then I did a degree in dietetics where I was told, you know, it's just sugars, no fiber. It doesn't make you feel full and it makes you fat. And that's really the rhetoric that many of us learned in nutrition science. Um, and again, it's looking at macros, right? It's kind of ignoring a bit of the micronutrients and bioactives. But moving forward, we, we published uh, the highest level of evidence you can possibly get on 100% juice and health. And we found that, that there is no association with increased weight, with insulin, with glucose from systematic literature reviews of randomized trials where they're giving them juice compared to water, most of the trials, right? So no adverse metabolic effect, no increased weight, et cetera, et cetera. But what was interesting is we found level B grade evidence for cardiovascular health, for C-reactive protein, for blood pressure lowering, higher level of evidence than we currently have to omit ultra processed foods from the diet. Higher level of evidence in support of consuming 100% juice compared to removing ultra processed foods. Correct, correct. So, it, so you know, everyone talks about how we need to omit ultra processed foods from the diet. It's bad. Thirty different diseases it's associated with. That's very low grade level of evidence in the confidence that we have that the association is true. Whereas with the juice research we did, it was actually level B, which is the second highest. In nutrition science, we hardly ever get that level of confidence with clinically meaningful reductions in blood pressure, for example. So it really changed myself as a researcher doing that science and most of us in the team because we went, wow, it actually can be a health-promoting beverage. And we look, when you look at the balance of evidence... Do you think it, it uh, matters how that that juice is made? Is it 100% juice or is it heavily refined and has added sugars? It's definitely different. And you have to be, you have to read the labels to make sure you're drinking 100% juice. So it's got to be 100% juice, not your juice with added sugars. What's interesting with juice and, you know, the myth that I see all the time online is that people say instead of smart swaps, right, for eating better, instead of drinking juice, eat an orange. Like mm. they're different needs. <laughs> you don't mm. when you're at a restaurant and the waiter says, "What would you like to drink as a beverage?" Mm. You don't say, "Oh, I'd, I'd like a cut up orange, please." So it's important that there's context, right? It is is are you drinking juice instead of drinking alcohol? Are you drinking juice instead of drinking a sugar sweetened beverage? Which is very clear, consistent evidence that it's bad for for your health. So it's it's context, and that's why and and it's cheap. Right, it's a cheap way to get loads of vitamins and minerals, in addition to the bioactives um, found, for example, mm. in oranges. I'm chuckling a little bit <laughs> uh, because it reminds me. Sometimes I get a bit of pushback from folks who are, I would say, a very purist in their approach to the consumption of fats, and uh, don't like the consumption of anything that's refined. And I guess so. I get pushback around my recommendation to consume oils like olive oil. And often I'll, people will say, well, you should just eat the, the olives instead, instead. And the, the reason I laugh is because it does overlook the application piece. You know, people are not cooking their vegetables in whole olives. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And it has all the other benefits of helping absorb lots of mm -hmm. fat-soluble vitamins and the added bioactives. What do you think is the healthiest 
juice? Is it orange juice? Is it grape juice? Like if you were to look at micronutrient content and bioactive content? Simon, it's like the car question again. <laughs> so I guess it depends, right, on what, where your outcome is. So it's interesting that orange, there's actually a lot of really cool research on orange juice. Um, there's hesperidin, hesperidin and norangin, two bioactive compounds that are a prebiotic. Um, there's, they've been shown to be associated with positive cognitive benefits as well. That, of course, that wasn't in a review because our review was a systematic review of systematic literature reviews. Um, but there's also a lot of evidence on those compounds in orange juice helping um, stabilize the blood glucose response um, post ingestion too. So, but then you've got, I guess, looking at more of the veggie juice, you know, beetroot juice nitric oxide, vasodilation, it's really good for the heart as well, really rich in potassium. And so I think the best juice is the one you love. <laughs> That's 100% that you're going to have every day. Like if I tell someone have cranberry juice, you know, if they don't love it, they're not going to drink it. And, and food is really only nutritious if it's eaten or drunk. Are you a an orange juice with pulp or without pulp kind of kind of gal? I, I'm orange juice with pulp, but I grew up without pulp. But I kind of <laughs> like the texture. <laughs> yeah, I guess yeah, it gives it another edge to to the beverage, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I'm definitely an orange juice girl. But in Brazil, I drink like there's uh, cocoa juice. I don't know if anyone's heard of it, but the like cocoa, which, which we make chocolate from, the pod has this beautiful white flesh, and that flesh is used to make juice in Brazil. Also, cashew juice. So the cashew has a little stem and that's the nut that we eat. But cashew fruit, again, has a really cool juice that you can drink and it's um, delicious. So in Brazil, I drink way more juices when I visit, but unfortunately here in Australia, the variety isn't as uh, vast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of my favorite tropical juices is guava. Yes, it's beautiful. Big fan of guava. Yeah, very high in lycopene. How do you feel as a nutrition scientist when you see nutrition information online or in the media that completely contradicts what the evidence shows? Um, furious. Like back in the day, I wanted to like throw something at the TV. <laughs> Nowadays, you're just like, I can't break my phone. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, um, it's infuriating, right? It's disheartening. At the same time, it makes me feel sad because there's so much great evidence that can help people feel good about the food that they're eating and actually have a meaningful effect on their health. Yet, we're in this day and age where you have non-nutrition professionals communicating nutrition science as if they know what they're talking about. That's why I kind of joined social media and I'm posting more in the last couple of years because I went, well, I've got to add to that evidence. All of us nutrition professionals need to start calling those things out. Do you have any tips for people that are consuming that information on social media? For someone who isn't trained in nutrition science, are, are there any things that could help them quickly identify if this person, this claim is trustworthy? Yes, um, put it into AI and ask if that person is credible in nutrition. <laughs> Very quick <laughs> test. <laughs> you know, for, and this, that's a modern way of checking. The old way of, of, of checking is like, who are they? What are their qualifications? We also have biases. We Each one of us have biases and we like to take information that feeds our biases, right? So it's always important to, to challenge your thinking or challenge what you're hearing. Is it because you like that information and that you believe it? And you want to believe it because it's what you already do or what you already eat? I like that reminder about confirmation bias in that whatever questions we're going to ask and whatever logic we're going to use to kind of determine is something trustworthy or not we should be applying that to information that we like and information that we don't like exactly that's going to be the most objective way for us to kind of sift through all of this information that we're being exposed to and 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 ultimately uh come up with positions that are most supported by evidence most well supported by evidence and you know science is never completely certain it's not cap truth with a capital t but the whole point of 
of the scientific method is to reduce uncertainty. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. And a reminder that nutrition science is a new science. So the first vitamin was discovered 128 years ago. Medicine has been around for thousands of years. So nutrition science is not only a new science, but it's an applied science. Unfortunately, we have the humans consuming the food, <laughs> which adds a very uh, complex right, um, data point that's very hard to control for. So it's remembering that nutrition science is new. Science changes. You know, we've seen it and we've seen it with juice. We've seen it with eggs and heart disease. We've seen it with nuts and weight. It's unbelievable. It just, it keeps changing and it does. And I think we need to embrace the science when the science has changed and it's consistently in one direction and there's clear mechanisms of action. So in remembering that the media also love headlines, they want the clickbait. So it, instead of being frustrated that one day nuts are good for you, the next day they're not, well, they're generally good, full stop. But um, it just question the headline, question the, the platform that you're obtaining your information from because they want you to click, they want you to read and often nutrition because everyone eats and everyone can relate to it, it becomes quite sensationalized. I think that's also another good sign when you see someone online who's providing nutrition information that has changed their mind yes. over time. It's It's yeah. typically an indicator that they're objective, they have some humility, they're not too, they don't have so much conviction that they're not gonna change their their views despite new science emerging. Exactly, like we did for juice. You know, mm -hmm. when we looked at the evidence, it was like, what? <laughs> I couldn't ignore it. I am absolutely excited to share an exclusive offer with the Proof community. This is a limited time offer just for my audience and no doctor referral is needed. Function Health is a comprehensive at-home blood testing service that gives you access to over 100 biomarkers, covering everything from heart, liver, kidney, and metabolic health to hormone levels, inflammation, and nutrient status. That, my friends, is five times more testing than the average physical. I chose Function for my own blood work and to be a sponsor of this show because they are the best in the world when it comes to helping you understand and own your health. It's true, the depth and quality of their testing is unrivaled. And as regular listeners of this show will know, you cannot optimize what you don't measure. Don't guess, test. Use Function to know exactly where your health is today, and then intervene with evidence-based medicine and lifestyle changes to feel your best and reduce your risk of chronic disease. With Function, you get access to very important markers like LP little a, a genetically driven cardiovascular risk factor, APOB, the most predictive marker of atherosclerosis, and LH and FSH, reproductive hormones typically missing from standard lab panels. It's not uncommon for these biomarkers and others to be elevated. For example, over 50% of Function members have an APOB level, and over 20% have an LPA little level that is above the optimal range. You can even add on harder to access tests like cystatin C, a very sensitive marker of kidney function, as well as selenium and iodine nutrients that are essential for thyroid and overall health, yet rarely tested. So what are you waiting for? Run over to functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill today and be one of 1000 listeners to score a $100 credit. That's functionhealth.com forward slash Simon Hill. 